I'll start the recording. Great. Okay. Welcome everybody. Tonight we have a great panel for you, uh, titled "The Legacy of Protest Art," and that's moderated by Lois Bender. And we have three critically engaged artists here with us tonight: Regina Silvers, Tamara Windham, and Sabrina Jones. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, as you know, the program is recorded with all rights reserved by ATOA. Um, we ask that the audience members just keep their mics muted while the presentations are being given. And then we can put your, we can have you put your questions and comments in uh, the chat here in Zoom and get to those at the end of the program. So for next week, just wanted to introduce next week's program before we get started tonight. Um, Monday, November 14th, we'll have our legacy series titled Americans in Paris. And that is gonna be a survey of the movement of American visual artists, actors, musicians, and filmmakers, uh, most of whom were former soldiers that studied abroad in Paris after World War II from 1946 to the early 60s under the GI Bill. So stay tuned for that program. And for tonight, I'd like to like, sorry, I'd like to introduce you all to Louise Bender, uh, our moderator and organizer for tonight's panel. Uh, Louise Bender is a longtime New Yorker who combines her background in art direction and graphic design with her fine art practice. Her brand Garden Spirits New York Designs was developed from her retail gift industry experience and her love of nature with a bachelor's from Hunter College, New York and the MFA from Boston University. Louise teaches art and watercolor techniques in the Metro New York area and is also an adjunct art professor at Essex County College in Newark, New Jersey. With that, everybody, please welcome Lois Bender. We'll introduce all of you to our guest speakers tonight. Thank you for being here, Lois. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, again, I'm Lois Bender, an artist and the moderator of this panel presentation entitled The Legacy of Protest Art with panelists Regina Silvers, Tamara Windham, and Sabrina Jones. These three artists are uniquely suited to discuss the topic since it is a major part of their practice. On the eve of our American Election Day landscape, tense with the suspense of a cliffhanger, we will address the art of political protest in these three diverse artistic approaches. First, for a quick art historical context, the legacy of protests may have begun with the 18th century Age of Enlightenment, with Honoré Daumier's targeted cartoons lampooning French society, with Goya's Caprichos, a series of etchings of universal follies, a tour de force critique against Spanish society, and the Englishman Thomas Rowlandson, uh, his political satirical critiques of Georgian Britain. This enlightenment sparked the 18th century political revolutions. In the 19th century, the turnover of art movements and styles seems to be the century's protest art. And to be honest, I need to research the 19th century a little more, as I was saying. The 20th century brings us Dadaists, Mexican muralists, feminists, uh, the, as in the Guerrilla Girls, and the century's bottomless Pandora's box of protest issues. And today we just saw the British environmental group, Just Stop Oil, pull a stunt, a stunt at London's National Gallery, dumping cans of tomato soup over Vincent van Gogh's sunflowers in oh. order to protest fossil fuel extraction and in other museums. Um, so this is also an assaulting of other great art masterpieces um, in, um, the, in terms of protesting art in performance art. For context, here are a few notable artists who have brought greatness to the protest theme in their time. Kathy Colwitz, Otto Dix, Leon Golub, Sue Coe, Jacob Lawrence, Ben Sean, Fred Wilson, Barbara Kruger, Feliz Gonzalez Torres, Fred Wilson, Barbara Kruger, uh, as I mentioned, um, Judy Chicago, Shereen Ashat, Banksy, Banks Ringwald, George Tucker, uh, uh, I Wee Wee, Kara Walker, and William Kentridge, and on and on and on, too many to mention. And now on to our contemporary 21st century artists. Regina Silvers is a passionate witness of American peaceful protest rallies. 
of every imaginable, uh, imaginable ilk and issue over the last 35 years. Tamara Windham, the second panelist, is a co-curator along with Seth Tabachman of the recent exhibition, Stop the Invasion, Artists Against the Russian Invasion of Ukraine. And we'll discuss the international scope of artistic protest against this war and her own involvement. Mm -hmm. And our third panelist, Sabrina Jones, takes on protests by creating graphic novels and comics about social justice and radical history using her unique humor, wit, and personal perspective. So looking at all these uh, personal perspectives about protest art, let's start with Regina. Artist well, Regina. You. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna- <laughs> Okay. Um, you me to wait till I read what you have to say about you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Artist Regina Silvers has been involved with fine art for her whole adult life as teacher, curator, art consultants, and a museum public relations manager the founder and president of Toast, the Tribeca Open Artist Studio Tours events, and as gallery director of the gallery at uh, Hastings on Hudson. She currently manages the White Street Studio and sh uh, shared with other artists where she has been making her artwork since 1990. Her current work illustrates considerable challenges we are fac facing today, as shown in demonstrations concerning such issues as abortion rights, gun control, social justice, and the assault on our democracy. Peaceful protest is one of our most important rights, and I'm focused on documenting, documenting um, this right while we still have it. Whenever she's inspired to draw, whether it is at a political rally, jam session, dog park, the beach, or a mountaintop, she usually records her experience in quick line and color sketches, capturing essence and energy. When not able to sketch on location, like at a protest march, she relies on photos from her cell phone, newspaper images, and her memory to translate these initial responses into larger paintings and drawings back in her studio. Well, thank you so much, Regina, and I'll turn the mic over to you. Well, thank you, Lois, for this opportunity, and thank you, Artist Talk or Not, for the last 40 years or so <laughs> of great Monday nights, and I'm happy to be part of it. Uh, as Lois said, peaceful protest is one of our sacred rights. And I have been documenting it in the, my work for the last 35 years or so. Uh, I will share the screen and hope that I can find the right. No? What happened? No? No, not no. sharing yet. Regina, did you hit the green share screen button at the bottom? Yeah, yeah, and I'm here. And, and does, I'm did you choose? Um, now your share oh, screen. Oh, share. good. Oh, good. I was trying to figure out how to tell you to do it, so I did it. Well, I, I um, know share screen, but uh, this is not cooperating the way it should. It says click to exit full screen. Okay, I'll do it this way. That's fine. Um, okay, this is my uh, my show on um, protesting. Regina Silva is still protesting. Let's see if I can uh, see how to continue this. Uh, okay, um, my first protest paintings, my placard series, based on newspaper images. Oof, I'm sorry, this is not. are based on newspaper images of conflict, both local, national, international. They were all current events. Mm. This, this changed radically in 2005 um, when a friend was a was arrested when she and other senior peace activists had attempted to enlist at the Times Square recruitment station because they knew that this would bring publicity and you know a lot of attention to the Iraq situation, the war in Iraq. So naturally, 
um, I became a follower and admirer of these women who after their trial and acquittal became the Granny Peace Brigade. I photographed their demonstrations as I marched with them and I painted from these photos, bearing witness, if you will, for more than 10 years. The raging grannies were part of the group. They, they wrote and they sang their anti-war songs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and they were a frequent subject of mine. <laughs> you can see why. <laughs> they were really, they still are, quite wonderful women mm -hmm. uh, who really animated a lot of the demonstrations. And, and, and made it a, a community affair. I also um, enjoyed painting this annual event, which was the July 4th reading of the Constitution. And this was Norman Siegel, the civil defense lawyer who had defended this grannies. And Marie, whoops, what happened here? Um, Sorry, how do I go? It's not, well. Oh. And the Mother's Day promenade in Central Park was another annual event. And in this event, the annual, uh, the reading of Julia Ward Howe's proclamation about the true anti-war nature of Mother's Day was, uh, was handed out as a handout and read to the people in the park. And the grannies also joined other large groups. Some of the, the um, former images were, were granny events, but these were larger groups with other peace and, and just um, peaceful protest groups. Uh, this one was, for example, uh, the anti-Wall Street bailout protest, which took place uh, down at Wall Street. And the anti-nuke rallies, this was one that was held, a very large international one that was held at Times Square. And we were also protesting our, our country's threat to use drone warfare on Iran. And so they had this interesting name, which was a Don't Iraq Iran rally. And as you see, my work is really in different medium, different sizes, just depending on my reaction. Another issue was the normalization of guns, gun use. And the grannies protested when NBC was going to have a game show. And there were, there were guns involved with this. So the grannies protested this and it was dropped. And yet another protest was even, even Senator Schumer when he did not support the anti, uh, the, the Iran nuclear deal. We protested at his office building, which was over there 783rd Avenue in 2015. At the same time, I was taking an interesting comic book course. And um, I was, let me see if I can show it to you. And I decided to use the grannies, whoops. I decided to use the grannies as this subject. Uh, and it took the form of uh, me speaking with my grandson and explaining why I was really too busy sometimes when he wanted to visit with me. I was too busy with the grannies. And through this book, I explained the grannies, my relationship to them, and the artwork that I made is while I was in the midst of all of this. Uh, you are welcome to browse this if you like. I will put the Oops, I will put the, what happened here? Sorry. I'll put the link in the chat. Although the 
first edition of my granny, Gigi and the Grannies, wasn't published, my, my book, I was really pleased to be uh, included in, in this interesting publication. It's called Shameless Feminists, and it was issue 50 of World War III Illustrated, which is, um, it's a, an American comics anthology magazine that's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. And this takes us to the Trump era. The Trump era was post-Iraq and it had a different focus and the focus ended up with a strong anti-Trump sentiment. This was a, a, a President's Day march in 2017, right after Trump was elected and they called it not my prez. Uh, and of course, that this was the time of the women's movement and the women's march, the huge women's march in New York City was the one I attended. And this was uh, where, we, uh, where we met before we joined the, the very large group of people at the march. And then along came COVID. <sighs> COVID was, as you know, one of the, uh, the latest dark, whoops, the latest dark events in our, in our lives. Uh, and the first thing that I participated here was a collaborative mail project to assist the USPS. Uh, Trump was really trying to put the screws on the post office. And there was a mail project uh, and a, co a colleague sent me a blank ledger sheet and all that was printed on it was a Chronicle 2020. So I chronicled, oops, I'm sorry. I chronicled the year, which to me was the COVID, the coronavirus, and then the George Floyd, the George Floyd assassination by the police. And this actually was the, um, the start or the, um, well, I'd say the, the making the, making the um, Black Lives Matter movement much more vocal, visual, visible and powerful. And so we have the Black uh, Lives Matter. And then we get, of course, <clears throat> to last year, January 6th, the insurrection, which issued yet another uncertain era, which I continue to document um, from the abortion rights movement and our reaction to the Supreme Court to the newest issue, which is really, as I can see, the gun control issue and the march for our lives from our children. Well, we don't know if the election tomorrow will bring more denial or repression or a change in attitude. But I know that I will continue to bear witness incident by incident for as long as we have our rightful freedom to speech and peaceful protest. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. We wanted to know if you want to ask a few questions right now for a few minutes and move sure. on. Yeah, so Regina is interested in having you ask questions. Um, since there are just two screens, I'll, I'll look for you or speak out because the three approaches and the subject material is, is just a little different. Um, and Regina, how did you have the stamina to go to all these marches. You must, you know, have been very dedicated. Very well, <laughs> they were during the day. My husband always said to me, don't get arrested. And I promised I wouldn't get arrested. And I came home at night. And it, it was really, um, when you're involved in something that, that's so invigorating, you really, you know, you wear flat shoes, you know, you dress comfortably, you take extra clothes and, and, and water and, and it's a beautiful day. 
when you can participate in something that you feel is important and that's instructive. I mean, when I marched with the grannies, they were very upbeat. In fact, somebody once said about my work, oh, it's very upbeat for, for, for protest work. But the grannies were, were an, a really feisty, um, instructive group of, of women who'd been through it all and wanted to teach people you know, uh, what was going on. So it was, it was not that tiring then. It is now <laughs> a little more, but um, yeah, I, I, I will continue to do it when I can and with, with whomever I can, because I, I feel that it's, you know, that their banner is democracy is not a spectator sport. And I, I just believe that. Do you have to be a granny to be in it? No, no, we have women who, who the grannies were the group of older women, 18 of them who, who got arrested, but their children, you know, are there, their grandchildren march with us. Uh, anybody can march with us and you don't have to be a certified granny <laughs> to march. You could be a, a father or grandfather or a son also. So no, it's open to all. Just go to, you have to go to peacebrigade.org and see when their next, be FOGs, friends of grannies. Uh, why don't we, um, instead of, let's keep the pace up and then we can ask more questions at the end, unless someone has a question right now. Yes, I do. My hand is up. Go ahead. I, Regina, I just, <laughs> seems like there was a certain kind of hat in those drawings. Is that part of there? Is there like a granny uniform? Is a certain uh, stereotypical big floppy? Oh, that, yeah, the raging. <laughs> The raging grannies. You see, the Granny Peace Brigade is made up of women of a, who came from a lot of different peace groups. Code Pink, Raging Grannies, Grandmothers Against the War. And the Raging Grannies wore these hats with the flowers all around them. And they were the ones who made the songs. The grannies, I don't have that showing too well in these images. The grannies wore what we call schmatis. They were yellow aprons that they slipped on and it said Granny Peace Brigade. And they were kind of yellow... Um, they were like, um, not in overall, but you know, something that you can just slip on over your clothes and tie up. So those were the two kind of unofficial <laughs> uh, uniforms. Like a, uh, an apron or some kind of- Yeah, but it was a front and back with a hole in it and you pull it over. I don't have it with me, no. but uh, it, was, it was yellow and it said Granny Peace Brigade on the back. It would say troops home now or, no war toys, you know, some some message. And it made us stand out when, when the grannies were marching with other groups, you know, so that there was a contingent of, of grannies marching with a larger group. And we were noticed, <laughs> more or less. Lois, I, I also had my hand raised to ask sure. a question. Sure. So Regina, um, it's a very different kind of uh, art form to paint and draw the grannies and then to turn them into a comic. Um, so what, can you talk a little bit about that process, what that well, yeah, was like I, and what you had to do? Kind of on a lark, I took the comics course at, at FIT and Ed Muir, a really great teacher, um, just asked us at one point to create a few characters that we could then build into a larger story. So I created a few characters and they were the grannies because those were my characters, you know, at that time. And, um, and it just grew, you know? And when the class stopped, I just continued because it became an interesting project for me um, to use what I was lear had learned in the class and to incorporate it, you know, in my own life. And, in, and I actually was able to put, <coughs> my artwork and it was excruciating. I wouldn't want to do it again, but I'm glad I did it. And I'm very grateful that um, that Seth Tabachman uh, included it uh, in, in this, his wonderful anthology. Uh, someday, I don't even think I'll bother having the colored one, the big colored one, which was more like a children's book. And I did try to get it published, but couldn't, didn't really know how to that well. Uh, so I'm just very, very pleased that uh, it's part of this serious anthology. I'll show you an image of it. Wait a minute. This is, this was the uh, 
the image from that year. And in fact, Sabrina, weren't you my editor there? <laughs> Uh, yes, and you better not hold that up too long because it's in my slideshow too. Oh, okay. <laughs> and there is another one coming out next year, right? We have um, the abortion. There is. All issue. three of us artists are involved in World War III Illustrated. That's so. right. That's right. Camara, oh, like yeah. You're all colleagues. Well, it's a wonderful team. Um, I think we'll just to keep things on pace. We should um, now move on. Thank you very much, Regina. And My pleasure. Thank you. I'd yeah. like to introduce Tamara. Well, I'll just read this for a moment about her background. Uh, Tamara Wyndham was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. She studied traditional drawing and painting at California State University, Long Beach, and more experimental drawing, book works, and performance at the University of California at Irvine. She moved to New York City, where she became active in various feminist, political, and spiritual and arts communities. Wyndham has traveled through Mexico and Central America, as well as Egypt, Morocco, Turkey, Spain, Czech Republic, and other parts of Europe. These experiences have informed her art. She has been awarded artist residencies at the Henry Street Settlement, the Cape Millet Art Colony, Vermont Studio Center, the Mary's Ceramic Workshop in the Czech Republic, Fondacion Valparaiso in Spain, and a fellowship from Earthwatch Watch to work in Orque, Spain. Hope I pronounced that correctly. So um, at this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to Tamara and uh, let her tell us about her projects. Thank you, Tamara. I'm looking for you. Muted. Hi, thanks. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, let's see, we're going to um, I'm talk, I'm going to be talking about uh, our show Stop the Invasion. Uh, this is a show of artists against the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And it's I started getting involved in this because I was in a show a couple of years ago before the pandemic in Moscow. It was an open call um, for art on bed sheets that was where it's going to be hung on clotheslines in a park. And I collaborated with a Russian poet uh, who wrote a poem about political prisoners in Belarus. And that's how I started to get to know um, some artists in Moscow. And um, the show uh, was not specifically a political show, but there were a lot of, a number of the works in the show were political. And so um, uh, we introduced them to World War III Illustrated, uh, Natasha Konyukova, um, was the curator of that show in the park. And um, she does these beautiful drawings, very moving drawings. And she um, got inspired to, to curate another show um, that she called Peravorot, which means revolution in Russian. And it was going to be a show of wordless comics. And she was asking artists all over the world to send JPEGs uh, that she was going to print and then show in Moscow. And then a couple of weeks later, the um, Russia invaded Ukraine. And she was like, oh, uh, I have to address this. This, uh, this show has to address this issue of, you know, and, and it was uh, putting her in a hard spot because uh, it was illegal to, um, in Russia, to criticize the war, to even call it a war or call it an invasion. Uh, you could get 15 years in prison for criticizing the war or calling for peace or showing solidarity with Ukraine. Uh, so um, Seth asked her, what can we do to support you? And she said, um, 
you can have another version of the show where you live and as many uh, people that can show this show all at the same time, then we won't feel so alone. So um, Seth Tabachman, my partner and I, um, worked on looking for a space to show it in New York. And we, um, he teaches at the School of Visual Arts and he got the School of Visual Arts interested. And he also, we also got um, C-Squat, which is also known as the Museum of Reclaimed Urban Space. So we were gonna have two shows in both in New York. We were very excited and we were working on it. And uh, the School of Visual Arts said, oh, we want our students to participate. And so Seth was talking to them about it. And he said, uh, tell them, tell the students, you know, only drawings don't send photos uh, because Natasha could go to prison for showing photos. And he wasn't expecting them to put uh, an Instagram post. And this Instagram post was very poorly worded. Uh, and it, it um, said, as you can see the last paragraph, it says, photographs may not contain documentary images of the war in Ukraine. And uh, people uh, reacted uh, very badly to this because it sounded like this Russian curator was out to uh, suppress the truth about what was going on in Ukraine by not allowing photos of the war, which wasn't the intention at all. And uh, so there were a huge uh, backlash with, with uh, people talking about how they were gonna shut down the show at SVA and, and uh, protest and and all this stuff. So SVA um, backed down and said, we can't do this show anymore. And then to our surprise, uh, the Museum of Reclaimed Urban Space also chickened out. So we aren't gonna sh do the show anymore. And, uh, and, and Hyperallergic even wrote an article about uh, the hellabaloo and um, they did contact Natasha and interviewed her and she held her own very well. Um, uh, she certainly um, didn't at all mean for this to be a, a Russian propaganda show. Uh, so uh, we were like, what are we gonna do? Um, and um, in the meantime, our friend um, Shalom Newman, he has a, a, he's a, he's a very talented, multiple talented artist. This is his uh, contributions to the Paravorit show. Uh, he has a museum in Easton, Pennsylvania called the International Fusionism Museum. And he offered his space uh, for the show. So, Seth and I and Ariel Kleinberg all got on the bus and went down to um, Easton to install our show at the museum. And there's Shalom. It's a really funky, wonderful museum. He has all these sculptures. And uh, so we were installing the show on the walls around um, these, these uh, sculptures. And we, uh, all of the JPEGs were printed the same size in a square format. And we mounted them on brown paper and put them up on the wall. And then we uh, put even more up. <laughs> uh, so these are views. You can see on the right, there's one of the wild sculptures in this museum and on the left is part of our show that wrapped around the museum. And um, Ariel and I did a, a pagan ritual of protection for Ukraine. This ritual was written by Ukrainian pagans and they asked uh, people to, uh, it was a prayer to Berhynia, uh, a Ukrainian 
mother goddess, a protective goddess. And, uh, and we're performing it as, as part of the show in uh, Easton. And in Easton, we had an international Zoom with, um, they were showing Paravora in Moscow and St. Petersburg and in Armenia. And we had a Zoom with them. It was very moving. Uh, it was very emotional. And, and the other, uh, there were performances in Armenia and, uh, and, and in Moscow and St. Petersburg, uh, they had to, the show had to be private. They could not, uh, they had to like, you know, it's like secret. They had to invite only their friends and uh, be a little hush hush about it. Uh, so it was very, uh, it was, it was a very intense thing. This is uh, Ariel's uh, painting of Berhynia. Uh, there's a, a statue of her in, in Kiev. Um, so uh, Shalom also has another museum in Prague and he took the show to Prague. Uh, and and then he also got it in Israel. This is in Yavne City. Uh, he also had it in Tel Aviv. And the show has been purchased uh, by um, a health corporation based in Tel Aviv. I'm sorry, I forgot the name. Uh, so it's in a permanent collection. Uh, and. Um, and my friend, um, Chris Cathead Reynolds, had a, a show in Miami, Arizona. I didn't know there was a Miami in Arizona. But, and uh, uh, he included Paravoro as a section of his uh, Cat Army exhibit. So Cat Army is below and Paravoro is above in this photo. And there's another picture of how he so everywhere it has shown it has changed a little bit how it's been displayed and how it's been edited so um after all this was over um Seth uh, and I decided we what we still wanted to show it in New York City and uh we uh contacted um Barbara Sherman at the First Presbyterian Church. And I wanna thank Barbara and the church for uh, letting us use their space. They have a beautiful gallery. And uh, they didn't want anything attached directly to the walls. So we made these boards. You can see there's a series of boards that we attached the artwork to. And we changed the show, we, we called it stop the invasion and at this point natasha wanted to drop out as curator uh, she knew that um, many ukrainians were put off at the idea of a, a russian curator and and she wanted to be humble and she said i'm not the curator anymore you tamara and seth are the curators now and we did use, we did build on her work. We used um, many, but not all of the images she chose. And she referred us to some other artists. Um, and uh, we made, see um, the Paravoro in Moscow and St. Petersburg had to be cautious about, uh, they wanted to be against the war, but they couldn't, come right out and say, you know, stop the war. So they had this edge that people in uh, countries with censorship, it's a whole issue to how do you make political art and not get arrested. <laughs> and, um, uh, but we don't have the same censorship issues uh, in New York City. So we pushed it to be more, our version of the show is more explicit. And uh, we um, went through the, the show and um, 
took out a lot of the the work that was less explicitly against the war. And we also recruited more Ukrainian artists. Um, it was hard to, re to um, recruit some Ukrainian artists. Some, a number of Ukrainian artists were, uh, were very happy to participate, but uh, we were very upfront that there were Russian artists in the show. And some Ukrainian artists refused to be in an art show that included Russian artists. And they didn't care what the Russians' position were, was. They didn't care that the Russians were against the war. They, ju they just were so angry and bitter that they uh, didn't want to participate. And I didn't argue with them. You know, when I asked somebody and they said, no, I just said, well, thank you. And, moved on because it's a, an emotional issue that you really can't argue with. So this is the first board and it has our statement that I could read, but I think maybe that's not necessary and will take up too much time, but it's a very strong statement um, against the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And um, and this is Seth's piece. This is actually a very old piece he made uh, decades ago. It was the first stencil he ever made, and it was uh, against the American invasion of Granada. And he reworked it to be against the invasion of uh, Ukraine. And this is a Palestinian artist, uh, really talented artist that you should look for his work, Mohammed Sabana. And this was our most famous artist in the show, Sue Ko. Uh, strangely enough, uh, we love her work, but strangely enough, we only included one piece of hers, even though she submitted several. We ran out of space really fast. We had a lot of art and we had to cut it down. Uh, this is one of the stars of our show, um, Volodymyr Bilik. He's Ukrainian. Uh, he uh, he was in Kiev and he was also in a, a town just outside of Kiev, uh, Zatomir, uh, where he grew up. And uh, the school that he went to and where his mother works was bombed. Uh, he he said that nobody was hurt. It was I I'm, I wasn't clear whether the the school was shut down or or whether it was just not during working hours. But anyway, nobody was hurt, but the school was destroyed. And he took a lot of photos, and uh, and then he makes this very abstract artwork. So the top of the panel are his photos. And the bottom is his artwork. And he, we wanted to include much more of his work, but we didn't have room. So here's a couple of the photos on the left. He insisted that we include this photo on the left. He was, has a drawing of a woman that he found and that was special to him. He said, you have to include that one. And, um, more another photo um and uh then uh we included his artwork he it's uh i it's influenced you know by russian constructivism he told me and other he's interested in dada um and he he does he does a, a variety of things. He's very very smart and witty, uh, and he he made this statement that I thought was great. He said, "Some folks say that I'm only doing art because it makes me feel better in my terrible situation." Hate to break it to you, folks. I'm doing art because I'm exploring the possibilities of human mind its perception of things, the application of various tools and its potential to create. There are other things that make me 
feel better in my terrible situation. Uh, and it is, uh, he is in the middle of the war. He's, he, um, he has to go into a bomb shelter off and on. Uh, sirens go off uh, when the Russians are bombing. Um, so another uh, uh, artist from Ukraine, I, I wish I'd gotten more pictures from for him, uh, Lubomir. He, I know him through the International Mail Art Network and uh, he has a, uh, he has a garage that is his his art gallery, and he has art shows in his uh, in this art space that's just so charming and wonderful. And we are going to send him uh, the Paravoro show to show in his garage. Um, I have to um, talk to him more about it, but this is some of his work. And uh, they, these are not his photos, but but he uh, collected these photos to show a, a museum that the Russians had bombed. Uh, he was angry about. Um, Lena Stern, I know on Facebook, and uh, this one was very moving to me. Uh, uh, she lives in Odessa and the Russians bombed her city and her phone camera wasn't working. And so she made a drawing to show what she saw. Uh, usually she posts photos. Every day she posts like a collage of photos and writes um, how many days of the war and like a little poem and describes the weather. Uh, and that's her Facebook post that I find very moving. Um, so she's a photographer and she likes to draw. Um, this is an, uh, a friend of Lubomir. She's in, in Ukraine. I don't know her personally. Um, and this is a, a friend of Volodymyr. This is, he drew this on his studio wall. Uh, And um, this is a, a statue in Ukraine. She made a, a photo collage. Uh, and this is one of our favorite uh, paintings in the show. Uh, this is a, a Jewish woman living in Russia and her parents live in Ukraine. And uh, it's called No Le Le Electricity and it says, when the power is on, Papa writes, we are fine, except it's 10 below zero here. Valya has thought of chopping nuts into soup. It's very nutritious. How are you preparing for Purim? So that gives like a whole uh, little snapshot of a family on either side of the border. And the cat, the lovely cat, I love this cat with the human face. I stumbled upon a Marc Chagall and found out that she had taken the idea of the cat with the human face from a Marc Chagall painting. <laughs> so that was interesting to, and the cat of course is wearing the Ukrainian flag. And this um, Victor uh, was living in Russia until recently and has uh, fled to Israel. And he's been making portraits of um, Ukrainians that were killed by the Russian army with a little story about each of them. He's, been, he's done many, many of these. I, I don't know how many, dozens, maybe more. And um, this was part of a whole series, a narrative and I, I can't show you the whole narrative, but this, the colors were so vibrant and strange, uh, a Russian artist. And it says, this is the last panel. It says, and even if now we are forced to remain silent, we will find a way to show our attitude to the current order. Hmm. 
this is a, a student at FIT here in New York. Uh, her, I think her mother is Russian and her father's from Latvia or maybe the other way around. And she, this is digital clothing and you, you give a donation that goes to Ukraine to support Ukraine and you you can have these clothes in your Instagram and you send her a photo and she digitally dresses you in her clothes. And I've been meaning to do it, but I haven't done it yet. But uh, you can find her on Instagram if you want to copy her name, Anita Morniex, if you want to get digital clothes in support of Ukraine. And, uh, from Italy, you remember the horrible, um, the slaughter of civilians by Russians in, in Bucha. That was just so shocking. And there were horrible photos. And um, Jean Luca made these, um, collaged his drawings. Uh, it's very poignant. I was very moved by these. And uh, this, uh, this artist, um, because we were showing in a church and the room is used for other activities that includes children, uh, we put these in a book rather than up on the wall. Um, so some of you, if you came to the show, might have missed these. Uh, but this is a protest in Prague. Um, about women being raped by Russian soldiers. And um, this is a friend of Volodymyr. She's uh, from Germany. And it's not so explicitly political. Uh, it was focusing on the blue and yellow of uh, the Ukrainian flag. And the sunflower, you know, is uh, the Ukrainian national flower. So um, there's been a lot of art using sunflowers. Um, and here's Regina, one of Regina's pieces uh, featuring the grannies that uh, she sent to uh, the original Paravoro show and we used in our uh, Stop the Invasion. And uh, Orange is um, married to Shalom Newman and she's a very talented artist. and. Uh, I found this a very moving uh, multimedia piece. And uh, Mary Campbell did a tarot, her own tarot cards. Uh, she did five of them. I'm only showing three for space, but. Uh, and the last one is uh, Putin and the chariot. <laughs> and um, let's see. And this is uh, my friend Chris, who had this show in Arizona, has a world peace design. And uh, Nicole Schulman did these radical animals. And here's the Russian bear being overgrown by sunflowers. And uh, Sue Siminsky, uh has an image of war and someone having a memory or a nightmare. And uh, Rebecca has the dove of peace escaping to freedom. Uh, this was, uh, this is a picture of our show. Uh, my friend Jana did a really moving uh, performance piece in the Museum of Modern Art. And she said she went into the bathroom and she used blood and wanted to do it fresh because blood turns brown and uh, painted this in the bathroom at, at MoMA and then put it on and, and um, walked around with her son. Uh, and I, I, uh, I thought that was a really powerful piece. Uh, and so we, uh, we, we just showed the dress in, in our show. And this is a Ukrainian artist living in New York City, uh, Kathy Helfen. 
And this uh, woven piece was used in a performance where she ha had these uh, yellow and blue flowers and people were to make a wish for Ukraine and insert the flower into the woven piece. And here she's talking, she also had a, a map of Ukraine on the floor that she was standing on. And one by one, anybody who wanted to could make a wish for Ukraine and put the flower in. So um, the, we made these boards with uh, most of the show, some of the show was original art, but most of the show was uh, printed JPEGs and they were mounted on, um, on boards. And the boards are going to the Unitarian Church of Staten Island and for a long weekend in December, the beginning of December. And that's thanks to Mary Campbell. And um, we're looking whether anybody else wants to display it. Uh, we can't, we don't have storage space. So if we can't find another venue, the boards are gonna go in the trash and that would be a shame. So if anybody knows a place um, that would like to show this show, uh, let us know. And thank you so much. Uh, and thanks to, there. as you see, lots of people worked to make this happen. And I we had many more artists than I could show in this talk. And if I didn't show your art, I apologize. Um, but really thanks to the many people that this was a, a huge international effort and um, it, it keeps going. Well, thank you so much, Tamara, because this was an amazing set of skills to organize an international show and keep it moving from venue to venue. It really is um, an amazing job that you and Seth did and the teams. So will she will she take a comment or two here? Or? Uh, well, we have room for one or two because we want to move on to Sabrina. Okay, very quickly. Uh, there's a show that opened, I believe, on the fourth in Brooklyn at a gallery called Dry Paint, uh, which features ten or twelve Ukrainian artists. Uh, artists of conflict is the is the concept, and that same show is also going to be in Amsterdam. And in Paris, I think it's going to be in Paris, like within days. In any event, I've already provided that uh, that curator with Tamara's contacts. That's all. Wonderful, terrific. And another comment? Anyone? I'm not seeing uh, another comment for the moment. It was so comprehensive, Tamara, so thank you so much. Let's move on and um, include Sabrina, our last panelist. And at the end, we'll take more questions. And okay, let me continue. Thank you so much. So Sabrina, you're next and I'll read a bio for you. I'm gonna be more inclusive in your bio. Sabrina Jones creates comic books and graphic novel novels on social justice and radical history with a particular focus on feminism and reproductive justice. Her books, Race to in Incarcerate, a graphic retelling, and Isadora Duncan, a graphic biography, were named great graphic novels by the Young Adult Library Services Association. Her more recent book, Our Lady of Birth Control, a cartoonist encounter with Margaret Sanger. A native Philadelphian, Sabrina moved to New York where she studied painting at Pratt Institute and illustration at the School of Visual Arts. She worked with Carnival Knowledge, a group of activist artists concerned about reproductive rights in the Reagan era. She drew her first comics for political comics magazine, World War III Illustrated, and has continued to edit and contrib contribute to many issues, including Shameless Feminists and the forthcoming My Body, Our Rights. Sabrina was a founding editor of the women's comics anthology, Girl Talk. She has created graphic biographies of Isadora Duncan, Walt Whitman, FDR, Jane Jacobs, 
Margaret Sanger, and Peace Pilgrim. She contributed to the following anthologies, Wobblies, Radical Jesus, Studs Turkle's Working, Yiddishkeit, Bohemians, The Real Cost of Prisons, and The Best American Comics of 2011. Sabrina paints scenery for film, theater, and television, and she lives in Brooklyn. So thank you so much, Sabrina. I'll pass the baton to you. Okay. Thank you, Lois. I, I want to just brag for a moment that uh, two of the artists you mentioned in your history of protest art are in the next World War III, Suko and uh, Guerrilla Girls. Great. So there you have it. Um, but more importantly, I want to wish everyone a happy election eve. I know election days are not always um, happy for us. Uh, in fact, my um, first presidential election I was able to vote in did not go my way. And uh, the election of Ronald Reagan was really a pivotal shock that made me become a political artist. I was in art school when it happened and um, it, was, it was an awakening that the world wasn't gonna be the way I thought it was gonna be when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s. And uh, action would have to take place. Um, so before I share my screen, I just want to um, tell you my plan. There's just gonna be a few slides uh, about my origins, how I got into political art, and then through that into comics. And um, I'll show you some excerpts from my, um, so my comics and my uh, political, uh, let me get, okay, here goes the share. Um, some of my uh, graphic novels. Close the chat. So when I uh, woke up in the eighties and found that the president was this um, right-wing throwback that I had not taken seriously at all, uh, Ronald Reagan, um, I looked around for a way to respond meaningfully and my roommate had met this group of political artists who called themselves Carnival Knowledge and were doing interactive games and performances uh, about, uh, as we then called it, reproductive rights. Um, and uh, so I started doing stuff with them while I was still in art school. Oh, I'm not going forward. Um, one of the actions, and, and I drew these comics about it later in Autobio Comics, um, this was from an action on the courthouse steps to commemorate the death of Rosie Jimenez, who was the first known victim of the Hyde Amendment, which cut funding for women who used Medicaid for their health care. So we dressed in, you know, funereal garb and had this cardboard uh, carton uh, uh, coffin full of illegal abortion uh, implements. Um, it was very moving, but um, generally um, I felt like the performance aspect of the carnival was not really uh, me. I was more of a drawing person. And so when I was approached by the editor of uh, World War III, we, he was also in art school then, we were just, we were all just starting out. Um, Seth Tabachman invited me to bring those ideas from Carnival Knowledge into comic book format. And uh, so that was how I began exploring comics as a medium of political messaging. It's a lot more portable and cheap than uh, putting on a carnival, as we found transporting the carnival to venues was, really cumbersome. And uh, so I began to draw things uh, about the issues that I cared about. And often it was, it was women's rights. Um, this is one of my early strips that really drew on my painting background and collage. And um, the theme of how abortion rights are not really just something that we use when we are unhappy with our pregnancy, but there's something that empower women to be able to live in the environment in a safe and bold way. Um, that the threat of rape, the threat of unwanted pregnancy is ever present in the streets of the city. And the fact that we know that we could ultimately safely escape from that fate. 
uh, of an unwanted pregnancy is um, is part of uh, our empowerment in life. So I went on and uh, contributed to many issues. These are covers of various issues um, from the first one in black and white, the first one that I contributed to, issue number three in the back there uh, with the black and white cover by Michael Roman up to the one in the foreground. Um, this uh, female complaint was the first women's issue that I edited uh, around, uh, I think it was uh, 1999 something. But at the same time, I was I was hitting the streets with protest movements, um, just like Regina and Tamara. We all we all get out there. I think we all get the same kind of thrill of being in a crowd, you know, uh, of people rebelling and um, being seen and heard and and picking up that energy. But uh, one of the things I joined that was really dismaying was the um, the clinic defense movement, um, because by 1990 clinics were reg regularly harassed and, and besieged by protesters. And sometimes what I did was to um, create artwork for those movements. So when we went on um, counter protests, uh, when the clinic was attacked in Dobbs Ferry, by then I had this stencil that I had made, uh, which you see over my shoulder, and that became a regular part of the protest. Another way for an artist to participate in movements. This is another way, a third way that World War III has participated on the, uh, the Women's March on the eve of uh, Trump's inauguration. World War III artists together with the shadow press had created this free tabloid that was handed out at the march and it's open to the pages that are illustrated by, uh, by Sue Coe here. One of my illustrations for that magazine, I also blew up and put on a piece of uh, foam core that you see me here. I was marching with it in New York in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral. <laughs> now, a big interest of mine was also the, um, you know, the radical history of people who came before us in protest movements. And when you see the way they're attacking uh, the curriculum in schools right now, it really underlines the importance of history. Um, a book like this inspired by the history of the birth control movement and uh, that has so affected our lives. Um, I, I hope it's on somebody's banned books list. I would, I would be proud. This book, hold on, let me do something with my view. I can't see the full screen. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to illustrate the life of Margaret Sanger and her work making birth control legal and starting the network of clinics that we now know as Planned Parenthood was because of my own coming of age in the 70s. Uh, sex ed back then was partly a matter of finding this book, Our Bodies Ourselves, on my parents' shelves and poring over it, trying to make sense of the changes that were going on in society that I was about to grow into. But the really useful information I got uh, was at Planned Parenthood. Um, that was like a school. The clinic was really an educational institution as Margaret Sanger had envisioned it, uh, where we went down there on Saturdays and all the, the, the teenagers were brought in, you know, with, in small groups with somebody who would explain all the various methods and their, their pros and cons for us to make our own choice. So it's interesting that the woman who started Planned Parenthood should be demonized so much today by people who are anti-abortion. Uh, it's ironic because she was anti-abortion too. Um, Margaret Sanger hoped that uh, she would eliminate abortion by legalizing birth control and discovering better methods of it um, and making it more available. But, uh, fighting uh, the powers that be that way. She fighting her whole life for what she believed in. She, she stepped on a lot of toes and uh, she had uh, many enemies then and, and does today. But the way she would tell her story about um, how she discovered her mission was this story about a woman she called Sadie Sachs, 
probably not her real name, uh, possibly a composite of Margaret's patients. But when she was a young nurse who worked in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, she often, she worked with obstetric cases and uh, she described Sadie as a woman who she treated, she nursed back from the brink of death after a self-induced abortion. And when Sadie recovered uh, from the infection, uh, she asked for information on how to prevent another pregnancy. And uh, the nurse, Margaret, asked the doctor who answered her disdainfully that uh, really she couldn't have her cake and eat it too. And she really, all she could do was tell her husband to sleep on the roof. Um, in fact, he, it would have been illegal for him to give her birth control advice. Um, we believe that rich women were getting information on birth control from their private doctors. Um, but, and that was, it was often considered a, a rich woman's secret that the working class women Margaret tended would ask her what the rich lady's secrets were because they had smaller families. Um, a few months later, Margaret was called back to the same patient and this time she didn't survive uh, the infection from another self-made abortion. And uh, that was the end of a young mother's life, leaving her husband and small children. She describes walking the streets at night, absolutely distraught and deciding that it was useless what she was doing, that this was just palliative and superficial. And what she really needed to do was seek out the root of evil and change the destinies of women. So what would she do? I, she would publish radical publications and ultimately she would open the first birth control clinic in America, right here in Brooklyn, in, uh, in Brownsville in 1916. This was an act of civil disobedience. She knew it was illegal. And, and in fact, she sent a letter to the Brooklyn DA telling them what she was doing um, because she had a plan. But she put out handbills ahead of time and uh, women lined up. Uh, to get this information from her. Her uh, sister, also a nurse, helped her. They provided basically, uh, it was like diaphragms, pessaries, rubber devices. Um, also uh, back then, people made their own suppositories from stuff they would buy at the chemist. Uh, so they had uh, sort of spermicidal suppository recipes. They also believed in um, douching after sex, which now we know is really very unlikely to work. <laughs> but at the time, that was that was a method that was that was advocated. Um, so all of these products that they displayed at their clinic were available. They were not illegal, but the information on how to use them for birth control was illegal under the obscenity laws, it was specifically banned anything that would induce abortion or prevent conception was, uh, was banned under the, the Comstock laws on obscenity. Um, at the same time, Margaret asked her patients uh, for their stories, why they were looking for birth control. Um, and she collected these for, um, to make her case, published a lot of them anonymously in a book called Motherhood in Bondage not a bestseller, um, but as she had planned, uh, Margaret was arrested. Uh, the clinic was shut down after a few days and she and her colleagues uh, went to jail. Um, she protested vociferously, but in fact, this was the idea, was to get a case that she could go to court and try to challenge the law. And she did make a little bit of leeway that doctors could prescribe uh, uh, for, um, conditions that could include uh, pregnancy. <laughs> they, she got on appeal them to change the definition of illness uh, so that it could describe pregnancy as a motive for which a doctor might prescribe birth control. Um, but it was just the first step. And this was only in uh, the laws of New York state. And uh, she would continue the rest of her, her life to expand the legal rights and, uh, and create networks of clinics. Um, this is an announcement from a, a current show at the city reliquary where um, uh, they make a case for the connection between Wonder Woman and the pioneers of birth control. 
shameless feminists <laughs> was uh, another uh, high estrogen um, anthology that you've seen already. I'm gonna, I was very much inspired by at the moment after the, the Me Too movement um, that we realized that we had to, it was time to do another women's issue of World War III. And this is our first collaborative cover that the figures in, who are protesting in the background are by the Indonesian artist Vitra DK. I drew the foreground image. Uh, Isabella Bannerman did the color and Sandy Jimenez uh, did the logo. You know, all that talk about the, uh, the Me Too movement made me um, think about stories that I hadn't told anybody when you talk about how common sexual assault was, it made me think of a story that I didn't feel like I was ready uh, to share in public, but I shared it with my co-editor, Isabella, uh, and, and she encouraged me. We went to the feminist zine show at Barnard and I was encouraged by a lot of brave young women telling really powerful stories in the intimate format of these small handmade zines. So I started drawing it that way, and that allowed me to talk about an experience um, that I was, uh, I was shy about. Um, until finally, I took my little zine pages and I put them four on a page, and they're in the magazine. And this strip, Whose Body, which talks about my surprise at being assaulted as a tomboyish 13-year-old when my girlfriend, I thought, was the one all the boys were looking at with her more developed body. Um, but in fact, it was me. I was picked. I was held at knife point. I was practically raped. I did see an opportunity when my attacker was distracted and I managed to make my getaway with my virtue intact. Um, but it left me with a profound distrust of the authorities who didn't come through with their offer to escort me to safety, um, fear of presenting this to anyone other than my closest friends, certainly not my family, didn't know of anything about it. Um, I, I somehow internalized it where I, I didn't explicitly blame myself, but I imagined that they would. So that's a form of self-blame, I guess. Um, but the main thing was, as a young woman, I suddenly had this awareness uh, of being um, an allure, you know, something that people might be stalking. And uh, there's more of the strip I won't share with you here about the various phases of recovering from that trauma and how I finally worked it out and, and grew out of it. Uh, this is the cover for our upcoming issue of World War III, My Body, Our Rights. I'm just gonna show you a bit of the um, brilliant artists who have contributed. Roberta Gregory is uh, one of my heroes, uh, author of the Bitchy Bitch character and uh, from women's comics and fanographics. And she is one of our veterans of underground comics who remember the era before Roe and have suddenly uh, raised their hands and said, yeah, I got a story for you. So here's her bitchy bitch character in Not Again. And another uh, veteran of the 70s underground comics and pre-Row, um, Lee Mars uh, did this panel uh, as part of a deep strip where she brings us through the issue of driving to get an abortion, whether it's, um, you know, back in the day when you drove down to uh, Mexico or um, now, people helping drive you to a state where it's still legal. And this is a strip by a group of people about times even before Roe when people still um, managed to safely go through these abortions. Um, this was the experience of Lana Clark Phelan and it was reported by Jenny Brown. The story was scripted by, uh, as a comic strip by Seth Tabachman and inked by Tamara Window. And this is a mother-daughter collaboration strip. Um, our longtime artist, Nicole Shulman, got her mother, Elaine Shulman, to write down a story that she remembered about helping one of her coworkers 
find an abortionist that she could afford in New York City uh, in the early 60s. And here's my experience. Uh, another story I didn't think I could tell, but somehow these World War III people put me in the position where I wound up telling these stories, the untellable. Um, I had an abortion when it was legal and there weren't even protesters outside the clinic yet. Um, but still, it was complicated, even in the best of circumstances. Um, it was confusing and um, as a young person right out of art school um, with a very active love life, um, the answers were not, were not easy to come by. So that's my exit <laughs> from my slideshow and uh, the, the back of the, the next issue of World War III. Um, I just want to comment on this idea of, of elections versus the ongoing issues, you know, because I, there's a part of me that says, hey, I started, you know, back in the 80s working on this, like, defending choice and abortion rights. And uh, I guess I didn't do a very good job because um, here we are losing this battle. Um, but uh, my medium is the comics and the artwork and the protesting. And um, that's what we can do. Um, you know, I hear a lot of analysis that the right wing backlash we're seeing right now is uh, because people are so mad that they've lost the culture wars, that most of America does want a more liberal policy on reproductive justice. And um, so as a cultural warrior, I, um, I salute my, my fellow artists uh, who have engaged in whatever kind of protest our medium allows us to do and hope that uh, the politicians uh, will do their job as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabrina. That was wonderful seeing your arc of development over all these years. Um, protesting is an endless job, so <laughs> no individual you know can take on. It's a it's a group effort. But um, does anybody have some questions for Sabrina? Let's see. Well, thanks for the yay, Tamara. <laughs> Like so I have a I have a question about Margaret Sanger, uh, and maybe it maybe it's a metaphor in a way for uh, the nuances within protest art, or the nuances within things that are protested. Um, the issue of eugenics tied to Margaret Sanger, and uh, first of all, I would say I you know totally applaud. Uh, her activity, her her mission on behalf of women uh, and reproductive rights, unquestionably a, a heroine, a hero in that regard. But uh, as we discover in many areas that have that have been protested along the way, uh, sometimes there's a dark side to it, and that's certainly. The eugenics thing is certainly an example of that, um, which I knew nothing about until fairly recent history myself. And, you know, the connection, the suggested connection to uh, the Nazis, to, uh, um, you know, ra racial injustice, et cetera, et cetera. Any, any thought about that or, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have many thoughts, absolutely. Um, it's very, she made a bad call, uh, really bad call, especially in light of what we know now, by seeking to ally the birth control movement with eugenics in the 1920s. Um, I, you have to know that at that time, before the rise of Nazis, eugenics was really widely celebrated in this country. It was taught in 75% of colleges and universities. There were things like eugenic baby contests at county fairs that were basically like healthy baby beauty contests. So there were people in the movement who were profoundly racist. And there were others who thought, well, it's just, just you know, people like W.E.B. Du Bois who thought, well, maybe we could just have stronger, healthier people if we 
did these things. And another thing to know is that birth control was not endorsed by doctors of the American Medical Association at the time, whereas eugenics was. Eugenics in the 20s was actually considered more respectable than birth control. One of Margaret's birth control leagues that she had set up in one of the Midwestern states, I can't remember where, they actually decided to change their name to the Eugenics League because they thought it sounded nicer because the, the root, it didn't have the connotations that we have now. As far as Nazis, uh, we believe they burned Margaret's books and her first husband was Jewish, Bill Sanger, the father of her children. So, and she did help um, Jewish doctors to escape from Germany by writing affidavits, uh, pretending that she had a job for them in New York. So I think that what we know about eugenics now uh, and where it ultimately went, which was super all bad, um, has been exploited to tarnish her because she actually was pretty racially progressive and all of the methods that she promoted were woman controlled. Um, and um, so I think it's blown out of proportion. I think that it shows the danger of trying to make an alliance with a group that where there are racists involved and there are people that, you know, that are going to tarnish you by association. Right. But uh, she was no Nazi sympathizer and she was not racist, so. Well, this was, I mean, it was pre-Nazi. I mean, what she was doing was, you know, something that it was occurring prior to the rise of the Nazis. Um, it's true, but she- uh, And they used, they used her- Her weakness, if I may, is that she was so single-minded in pursuing birth control that she, she who had started her life as a radical socialist in the labor movement, she went courting rich people and Republicans. And so she would, Rockefellers donated to her birth control research. So she would pretty much um, talk to anybody who would listen to her about birth control. You know? mm -hmm. And so that often put her in some bad company. And was that a good call? Maybe, maybe not in the light of how her name has been tarred now. It's not, but I, I really think that what she did was so much more good than harm that uh, it disturbs me that uh, that Planned Parenthood is afraid to use her name uh, on their clinics anymore because like me, they're tired of <laughs> having this conversation, you know, right. which started with, with anti-abortion people putting this out there and putting out like photoshopped pictures of her in a car with Hitler, you know, who she right. never met. Right. Um, but um, now, like a lot of a lot of people are just afraid to go there. No. Right. Um, well, I did bring up the fact that I think that the protest issues are Pandora's box. That we have so many things to protest, <laughs> and um, you know, a comment I have is that another major issue is the environmental um, protest um, movements, of which. Um, we haven't focused on tonight, but there there are so many things that people find they need to speak out about as artists. Um, but thank you so much, Sabrina, for such an informative um, uh, body of work that educates. Obviously, protest art is educational for new generations coming coming on board. Uh, does anyone else have some questions for any of our three panelists? It's been so engaging that we're beyond our hour and a half. Um, if I may, I, I'd like to just comment. Um, first of all, thank you. All the panelists are just absolutely marvelous. And um, Sabrina, vis-a-vis -vis your comment about, um, you know, perhaps um, victory has not yet been achieved. I think warriorship in regard to issues, perennial issues like war and the struggle for reproductive rights um, require constant regenerating, require that flame. And with two daughters myself, I always felt that the, the idea of warriorship is something that they needed to embrace. Sometimes you're tired of it. Sometimes you need to be spurred. And all of these examples um, are really phenomenal ways in, they're portals into renewing one's activism. 
um, you know, at the at the Women's March in Washington some years ago, <clears throat> there were a group of women who were older, including disabled women and a woman in a wheelchair with silver hair was holding a sign that said, I can't believe I'm still protesting this shit. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think... I think we kind of veer back and forth between rage and disgust and determination and endurance. And all of the artists featured here today um, are giving us that, that, that strength. So thank you. That was a great uh, summary. Really. I have a question for Regina. Uh, Regina, I, it just occurred to me, I have the grannies either addressed or faced ageism. I, I mean, it seems like well, you yeah. know, the people like, oh, you're, you're too old to blah, blah, or whatever. Well, yes, and some of the women that marched, well, um, the, the image of the um, reading of the Constitution, for example, that was in my presentation, the woman there, uh, Marie Runyon, was 95 years old when she was, when that picture was taken, she lived to about a hundred and all her life she had been an, a real social activist. And the grannies, I mean, so many of them, a few of them are no longer around, a few of the people that I marched with, but they were in their eighties and nineties. I felt like, I felt like a kid <laughs> next to some of them. And they were the feistiest, um, funniest, you know, they, they were just, they had led a whole life of doing this and they weren't about to stop until they couldn't walk. And actually one of the women walked, did all the, I don't know if I included that image of Betty with her walker. I mean, they, they marched with their walkers and with the canes. Uh, it was, it was really, uh, what could I say? I mean, it, it was the way it should be. You know, we don't stop uh, until we drop, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> But have, um, I mean, how have you maybe been discriminated against because you're older or like has, do you ever feel that maybe somebody's rejected you as an artist or for other reasons because you're too old or, or have the grannies like, Hopefully. oh, we don't. I don't know, I can't, or, or, or maybe patronized. Oh, they're cute, they're old women, they're harmless. Like, I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just uh, wondering. Well, it, it has been interesting to grow older. I mean, when I put my, the pink in my hair, I mean, teenage boys go like this to me on the street, you know? It's like, uh, I'm still being, you know, considered a person, you know? And because so many of us feel invisible. Uh, at a certain age, we're treated that way. Uh, yesterday, I helped the woman get a cab because she was standing there with a cane on Union Square and I was about to cross the street and the taxi went right by her and wouldn't pick her up. And I, before I had my hip taken care of, I occasionally used a cane for a few months and I knew that feeling that happened to me too. So, I helped her by standing next to her and practically standing in front of a cab that went by. I hailed the cab, I opened the door and I pushed her in. But it it happens and you know, it's is it worse than what Sabrina was was uh, describing about, you know, just the men making the rules that women can't have <laughs> reproductive uh, freedom or 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 uh, I mean, we're living in an unfair world. People don't always treat each other the way they should. What are we gonna do? We're not gonna curl up and sit down and die about it. We're just gonna fight back and keep doing what we're doing. And you know, when we can, we do something back, you know, that, that rights the wrong, or we just pay no attention. For seniors, I think that healthcare issues are tantamount. Um, but you know, I, I don't know, there's so much to protest for all ages. <laughs> I think I think you can't discriminate. There's no discrimination for people who are protesters. I mean, you can protest, as Regina said, any age. Really, I I I um I so appreciate all all of your work, but I I also think there's another take on age, uh, as an aging woman. <laughs> um, you know, in a way, you can be more subversive or you can get into things or get into places. 
I found when you are older, because people don't, people maybe do overlook you, but the overlooking might be an advantage to get away with things, to get to assemble and, and do things. And, and people do think you're harmless. And of course, yeah. women have never been harmless. I mean, the suffragettes also at advanced ages, when I did a lot of research on, on suffragettes, you know, they also protested when they were of advanced ages and um, they were able to maybe get places that not that maybe younger women were, were not able to do. Well, yeah. Yeah, Ellen, that reminds me of, of, of one incident that I, I saw when I was with the grannies. And, you know, a policeman said, please don't make me arrest you. My mother will kill me. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it was it was it was like that. You know, they they it, the age does have the effect of, you know, OK, ladies, you know, I don't want to arrest you. Please disperse, you know, and some of them don't and they get arrested. You know, it's it, it's an interesting situation. And, and please disperse kind of sounds like please behave to me. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Can I, I, I know we're past the time, but I, I can't resist just asking a quick question of Tamara. Tamara, did you feel that the hyper allergic uh, focus on the controversy around your exhibit uh, fell into the category of uh, any publicity is good publicity? How did you how did you stay on track? How did, how did you avoid getting sucked into the morass of the controversy and keep the exhibit evolving? Well, um, well, well, I I don't think uh, I didn't think the hyperallergic was good publicity for us. And I one thing that uh, we 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 thought about was how they they wanted to cover the controversy, but when we actually had the exhibit at the church, we contacted them and tried to get them to cover the exhibit, but they weren't interested. They weren't interested in the art. They were interested, you know, it's the controversy that sells, you know, so, so, you know, it's just, you know, that, that's why um, social media is such a mess, you know, that, that when, people get into fights that's when it gets all the attention and 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 i don't know just so it, it, i don't really have much respect for that uh but i think we kept going ahead because of the support we did get that that shalom first offered his space and you know then uh barbara sherman you know helped us with the first Presbyterian church, and now Mary Campbell has stepped forward to uh, have it shown in, in Staten Island in December. And uh, and so it, this has been, you know, this, this show has been the biggest network of artists I've ever participated in, really. I mean, I I mean, I know World War III actually also is a huge network of artists, too, but it's 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 like the network of so many people participating and and helping each other that's made me go forward with it i think that controversy comes with the territory and that we'll it will it will be unbelievable after tomorrow yeah. with, with warring sides of protest and uh you know it's it's depressing but it's coming with the territory of our political lives um, so I, I don't even want to speculate, but I think you all know what we're talking about. I, I think young women, if, if, if things go badly, I think young women are going to, I'm, I'm hoping they'll rise up for some of us who can't always rise up and to protest because we, 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 we need people. We, we need foot soldiers in this just to express and fight back. Well, we'll probably have to have another protest panel <laughs> in six months <laughs> to keep track of what's going on now. <laughs> or perhaps maybe like we could have a, a, ma a ma mass mailer. You know how people get these things in the mail? They could get like these postcards made of like comics or something. Hmm. Well, it's an active issue, I know. 
it, as long as there are humans, there's going to be protest. <laughs> um, I think it's been a wonderful panel. Um, I really don't want to cut it off, but I know that it's been long and a lot of people um, have other obligations this evening. Uh, does anybody else want to have a last say, a last word? <laughs> Wrap things Anyone up. Anyone going to protest? <laughs> yes, thank you. I do have one question. Um, you mentioned briefly at the beginning about like the uh, the uh, climate activism that are throwing tomato soup on art. On, on art, I, I it almost felt like you were you were about to say something about it and this decided not to or or something. Did you have thoughts about? that kind of protest? Like, is it effective in getting their message across? Well, it got noticed, I think, and the country it made controversy. And it's about hurting famous artwork to get attention because they did it in the other cities. I think there was a Botticelli that was harmed. Ooh. I mean, each one of the European, many of the European, like five other cities had this uh, protest group work on that. So I don't know deeply in what it is in depth. I do know that attention getting will will be part of protest. And, you know, I don't know. I'm, you know, as it relates to stopping oil, you know, I, it's just very frustrating. The big powers that control the earth, you don't know what messages will get to them, especially if politics isn't working. Um, but I know that everything is about getting attention. And um, you know, I'm speechless about it, but the you know, keep be be alert to what's going on in the protest um, arena, because um, it's worldwide. I mean, I'm not even following Asia. I mean, we we have so much to look out for. There is so much going on, you know, from local issues, local um, parts of the world, um, to the major worldwide issues. I mean, right now there's a climate a um, uh, uh, big world uh, meeting in. Um, where is it everybody um in egypt yes thank you thank you um so it, it's so much to be explored um perhaps in the in another protest panel we can have um work with people working with environmental i know that marsha annenberg is producing a show in december um called may day earth and she's going to be on a pa uh, have a panel on november 28th uh, there are 13 artists in that show. I'm one of the artists, um, but she'll be talking about uh, protest art from the point of the environment and ecology. And so be on the lookout for the next protest panel. But, um, the, you know, ATOA loves great ideas from all of you. And um, just speaking for them, that there's, you know, always great um, ideas to follow up on something like this. I mean, if one wants to look at um, this um, uh, recent protests of hurting masterpieces. Should, should artists hurt masterpieces to create controversy? <laughs> you know, who knows? Um, anyway, any thoughts? And then we'll say good night. Anybody else want to chip uh, chime in? Great. Well, I just hope to see you all in the streets if the elections don't turn out for us tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> one, I have one, one, no one has mentioned the protests going on with women in Iran. Mm. And I think that that is an area we should all be paying attention to. Iranian women really could use support. I'm not sure where or how, but we should all be paying attention to what's going on there as well and vote. If you haven't already done so, vote. And thank you for an incredible panel. Well, Bonnie, thank you so much. And, and uh, Bonnie, thank you for your uh, <laughs> your sending me the chronicle to do for the that uh, wonderful collaborative effort that we had with you. <laughs> yeah. Chronicle. Thank you for collaborating. It was a value. <laughs> it was, it was, a wonderful was the best time thing. I had during the pandemic. I can tell you that. <laughs> Yes, it was mutually wonderful. Thanks go all around to everyone. So um, I don't, I don't control leaving the meeting. I just want to say on behalf of everyone at A28, thanks again. Thank to all you, the everyone. Thank you. Thanks Super for moving, important work. Night. It was wonderful to see Kristen, you. Kristen, Lois, and Thank you, Sabrina, Tamara. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. Thank you.